Chapter 114 The rocky terrain under Damien's foot let out a loud shake. Rumble. At his command, the entire multi-kilometer wide earth platform was suddenly shaking. Sounds of pixelization went off as countless red lines and patterns emerged on the ground. The young man then jumped into the air and landed back on his ship. Creek. The makeshift arena let out a faint growl as the entirety of its mass was instantly demolished to the very atoms that held it together. In no more than ten seconds, the entirety of the area had exploded into red dust, vanishing into thin air, as if they weren't even there in the first place. Dash. Damien clapped his hands, swatting off the non-existent dust away. The heavy lifting was done and the young man had something else in mind. And yet, Damien suddenly felt a cold, ghost-like presence nearby. His eyes drifted to the side, zooming in and onto the Titanic that gently floated in the seas. His vision landed on a single man. He had long pink hair and a red long coat. The man was drowning himself in liquor. Hum, Damien hummed as his hockey seemed to flare in a warning and yet nothing out of the ordinary could be seen. Damien's intuition was usually correct, and such what he felt from the drunk pirate was something truly vile. Though at that moment, thud, the entire suicidal Rambo shook as a shadow landed from God knows where. Damien's eye twitched as he felt the newly arrived man. Damn old bastard, don't break my ship, he thundered out. Zahaha, don't sweat the small stuff, Damien brat, a menacing voice went off. It was Zebek, just his arrival caused the nearby pirates to immediately scamper off, some even dived into the sea below out of primal fear. As for the man's appearance, his black cloak was devastated, some pieces of fabric even melted into his skin. A few scars were added to his chest, but other than that, he seemed rather lively. I had my fun with the bird, now show me. Where's Garp or Sengoku? He cackled in excitement with a savage grin. Shaki blew out a cloud of smoke from the side. You're a bit late, Tycho. Damien Chan already sent the Navy running more than 30 minutes ago. This was not exactly good news in the captain's eyes. Ha, huh. those assholes ran away, quick, go call them back. I haven't quenched my hunger yet. He roared out. The pirates who stood at the close by ships almost fell down as they saw their fabled captain acting like a spoiled child. Under the might of Zebek, the other, non rocks pirates were in great distress. Wang Ji reigned in his usual spirit and waited on the side. The pirates from the festival who joined in alliance with the rocks took an audible gulp as they saw his savage nature. Let alone the ending of the fearsome overlord. Rayleigh who had gone to the Oro Jackson stood tall upon the helm, his fellow crewmates were prepared for combat, weapons ready. Hum. Zebek's eyes drifted to the Roger pirates as a curious hum escaped his crusty lips. Zahaha, you're that Roger's subordinates. Did that fool finally join under my flag? He wondered out. His words could be assumed as a question, but under the glow of Zebek's eyes, it seemed more like a statement. Anyone daring to go against it would be cut down without mercy. Under Damien's curious eyes, many men shifted in their position as the glare of the great essence sharpened. Yet a soft yet confident voice interrupted. Rocks D. Zebek, make no mistake, our captain has no intention to join you. Quote dot 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 quote. The onlookers were ready to run as they could feel the tension rise to a dangerous level. Zebek let out a savage laugh as his curiosity peaked. Oh, you're his vice captain, Rayleigh, was it, Zahaha. That fool really found a capable pirate. Under him. But that curious smile turned savage and feral. Pure rage in the form of hockey leaked out from the man's eyes as great pressure was thrust upon the Roger pirates. Creek. The mighty Oro Jackson trembled as Rayleigh unsheathed his blade, unfazed and ready to strike. Boom. Two thick bubbles of hockey collided into a spectacle of silver and black. Rendering the air frozen. Thud. A younger pirate fell on the ground as he stood nearly 200 meters from the point of conflict, his body reeking of urine. From the very start for most of the current present, Zebek was synonymous with their greatest nightmare. Even the great fleet Admiral Kong won't cause such a reaction and yet Zebek was something far worse, especially when he was angry. On the side, Damien nodded at Rayleigh's courage, humming with admiration. But under the turbulent torrents of hockey was something else. Wahahaha. It was another booming laugh. Zebek, don't give my partner such a hard time, if you have a problem, why don't you come to me? Though the voice sounded rather friendly, 
it was laced in incredible levels of danger. It was more than just a threat, but rather a declaration of war. Zebek's fearsome eyes moved to the man who stood on the shore of the now broken Glint Island. He had a red hat, large mustache, a fearsome grin and a sword at hand. Gal D. Roger. Roger was a man who, under endless danger, would never turn tail and run. Retreating was simply absent from his dictionary. His usual joking demeanor, however, can flip into an unbridled rage that even the fleet admiral feared. X ahahaha. Roger, it's good that you've come. The big boss erupted in similar degrees of beastly nature. The two seemed to be moments away from entering a full-blown fight, however. Tycho, it's best to hold off on any more fights. The man turned his eyes to the side, slight irritation flashed by it. Shikuyaku, are you getting in the way of my fun? The woman let out a cloud of smoke, her eyes wavered slightly. Of course not, Tycho. But our fleet has taken a great hit and the majority of our ships have been destroyed. If you end up in a full-scale fight with Roger, I'm afraid all the forces we collected over the past few years would have been for naught, Shaki explained. Asterisk Vu, a soft wind blew as a nearly 11-foot-tall pirate appeared next to Shaki, as a shield. Black hair, red streaks on one side, casual demeanor, it was Damien. Old man, Shaki Nay isn't wrong. Our numbers already dipped down to almost 10,000. If you really want blood, you can go take out the 14,000 or so pirates that Saul has deployed over the two forts at Superbia. Damien's eyes then glowed red in observation. Plus, the marines are still on my radar and seem to be regrouping 3.94 kilometers away, most likely waiting for backup. Even if you make it through, our numbers will only continue to fall. Zevik was arrogant and reckless but he had the strength to back it all up. At the moment, Damien was practically telling a wild beast to not dine on its favorite meal. And like any hungry beast, they tend to be rather aggressive. Asterisk VRRRR. Zebek squinted his eyes as the torrents of hockey descended upon the red-eyed youth before him. The weight of endless bloodthirsty spirit fell upon Damien. Yet the latter didn't even twitch. Zahaha, you've gotten stronger, boy. He laughed in a deep voice. But you're not wrong. Cutting down the numbers anymore would be troublesome, especially with that fateful day approaching. Zebek's voice grew slightly distant as if he were in deep thought. No one knew what the crazy pirate was thinking and yet it somehow caused fine sweat to trickle down the backs of many. Fine, he grumbled. Shikuyaku, take the rest back to Hashinosu. I will return when I'm done with the fresh meat at Superbia. Asterisk Vush. Zebek then vanished into a blur of black dust. No one knew where he went. Damien gave out a light sigh as he felt the weight lift off his body. Zebek was an unpredictable force of utter terror and arguing with him would usually turn out quite bad. Wahaha! The Sin Incarnate then looked to the side as he saw a man with a wide and thick mustache land next to Rayleigh. Damien, I remember you from that Borealis auction. Dash. Gall D. Roger. Age. 37 years, 7 months. Height. 9 feet 0. Devil Fruit. None, skills, incredible talent in all colors of hockey, true conqueror, will of D, plot armor, self-taught Rokushiki, great talent for swordsmanship. Hockey, Grand Mastery I, 4 O, Mastered Advanced Armament, Grand Mastery 3, 4 C. Strength, Middle Stages of Top Tier Yonko. Dash, Roger then tapped Rayleigh's shoulder as the latter seemed solemn. Saul is dead, I had a lot of fun here. Roger's eyes then took about a mysterious glint as he looked back at Damien. I feel like we'll cross paths soon, kid. See you then. With that said, the Roger pirates loosened their sails and made their way into the horizon. Dash. A little while later. Oye. Kaido, why the frown? Damien asked as he looked at the brooding giant bathing in sake. Asterisk sniff. Damien, you bastard. Sniff, just wait. I'll bash your head in with my club soon enough, he bawled. He became a weepy drunk, Damien rolled his eyes. Don't worry, I'm sure your bounty will increase, Damien tapped Kaido's shoulder in a comforting fashion. Though even then, the distance between the money on our heads would only widen. The sin incarnate muttered with a smirk. Kaido's eyes blasted open, instantly sober. You bastard. The club in the ogre's hand seemed to extend its wielder's fury. Reimei Hake, 
The lightning bathed club of pure brute strength smashed the air apart as it raged its way towards the casual Damien. Boom! A loud shockwave graced the ship as the floorboards creaked in pain. Grr! Kaido growled as he saw the result. He saw his club that was strong enough to flatten a giant being stopped by a single finger that was bubbling in a crimson aura. Ow! The ogre roared on as his eyes were filled with fury. The sparks of Conqueror's hockey swam through the club and upon Damien who widened his eyes in slight surprise. So he can use infusion when he's angry enough. The young man concluded. Asterisk Voosh. Like a phantom, Damien disappeared, causing the giant Kaido to flop forwards due to inertia. Asterisk VZZZ. Damien reappeared a few meters in the air, face to face with the falling Kaido. Asterisk Corrupt. Damien's left fist was bathed in emission hockey as he took a punching stance. Bam! Without hesitation, the fist went forth and slammed upon the beast square in the face. Ripples of force swam through Kaido's giant face as his eyes winced in pain, presumably due to the rattling of the brain as a mild concussion seemed apparent. Like a bullet, the brooding beast was shot off the ship and soaring through the sky. Crash! Ah! My leg! The ship is sinking! Abandoned ship! Ellipsis. Tens of voices cried out as one of the ships at the very edge of the formation seemed to shudder in pain, cracking all over. The sails collapsed as the ship was torn up from Kaido's landing, sinking immediately. Damien was satisfied that his shot had made the target and he smirked into the distance. Though a soft voice went off behind him. Damien Chan, most of the pirates are readied and the ships that could be fixed are so as well. I will start sending them back now, are you coming too? Shaki asked. Damien shook his head, you go first, Shaki nay, I have a little someone to meet, I'll return later. He then looked at the silver armored man who stood like a tower. Andor San, I'll leave the newly joined in your hands, there's quite a bit of mending to do. Silver Axe just tapped his weapon on the ground, leave it to me, Damien Kuhn. Dash, a few kilometers away, a few hours passed on as the rocks pirates had left. Darkness bathed the seas as night had come to grace the world. Peru, 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 Peru. Kacha, a large afroed man picked up his transponder snail. This is Admiral Sengoku, he said formally. Hum, Sengoku, how's the regrouping going? A deep voice replied, it was the fleet admiral. Sengoku sighed with residual anger, I failed, Kong San. My miscalculation left far too many casualties, even the beacon of hope, the Ox Lloyd's warship was left. Being an admiral is a great honor, but with that honor comes the responsibility of countless lives. And lives can be lost. Don't get lost in the abyss of regret, conquer it and bring forth the, reigning justice, you live by. Kong's voice was sharp and heavy but held a slight nostalgia to it. Enough about that. No one could have expected that monstrous brat to have such a thing up his sleeve. Sengoku gave a slight nod and continued. I hope you can get approval for that, Kong San. I'm afraid without it, the rocks pirates will be far too difficult to overwhelm. Especially with the momentum of Soul's fall. Quote dot 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 quote. There was a slight pause. I am working on it. The Garose have yet to approve of it but it should be given soon once news breaks out of what happened today. Beyond that, Xerxes has also sent his men to restrain the rocks, don't worry too much. Kong's sighs were heard over the snail. Anyways, how's the situation there? Sengoku looked to the side and saw the marines running overdrive, fixing and remedying what they could. We'll be ready to return by the time dawn hits. There are 300,000 civilians at Superbia, I can't just leave them at Zebek's mercy, the admiral replied in a determined tone. The fleet admiral knew it was too much to ask a conqueror to yield so he compromised. I won't stop you, but I'm sending you supplies and backup from G5, they will be there by the time the sun rises. There will also be a VIP there, do not leave without them, that's an order. He said in a strict voice. Sengoku slowly nodded but then asked. All right, Kong San, but can I ask who this, VIP, is? Quote dot 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 quote. It's a little unorthodox in terms of support, just don't kill him when you see him. He is quite valued by the five elders. Kacha. The call ended. Dash. An hour passed. Per or until the musical note, Perispero licked his cane. He is very loaded after all. The man stood before a giant vault. 
sizzle. The thick metal let out great amounts of steam as a blazing palm was slowly melted through it. The metal is too damn thick. Oven cried out. It was a greatly reinforced steel that held Superbia's gold reserves, surely an exuberant amount considering it was the stash belonging to an overlord. Creak. Rumble. And finally, the metal gave way as Oven walked in. Perispero's eyes widened as he saw the endless stacks of gold and diamonds. It was a ridiculous amount. That Saul really likes the gold color, Daifuku muttered as he saw it. At the center sat a few special goodies. A sword with a stylish katana, a giant blue stone of unknown symbols, and a blue fruit with sharp azure scales and a green stem. Is that a great grade sword? There's a poneglyph too. You guys, look here, there's a devil fruit here. Ellipsis. While his siblings were busy with the other items, Katakori froze in place. His eyes jetted over to the side, nothing was there. What is it, Katakori? Oven asked as he saw his older brother frozen like a deer in front of headlights. Quote dot dot dot, nothing, it just felt like something was watching us from the shadows. His uncertain voice resounded the golden halls. Per or until the musical note, don't be so paranoid, Katakori, there's nothing there. Come here and help me collect all the gold. Chapter 115 Another two hours went by as Sengoku was ready to return to Superbia Island, not to wage a war, but rather to salvage what was left and control the chaotic tides that have originated at the island. On top of that, he had 300,000 civilians to attend to. This, backup, Kong San talked about, I take it should arrive soon. Basara's coarse voice graced Sengoku's ears. The latter was currently watching the calm seas nearby under the slowly rising sun. The mixture of the two aspects caused the tides to glow a warm orange. Cries of birds went off overhead as a serene yet solemn atmosphere remained. Hum, any time now. Speaking of the devil, a voice went off. Taisho Dono, there's a fleet of ships approaching from the west. A rear admiral informed the two. Sengoku just nodded. The rear admiral seemed a little stiff. What is it? Uh, the ones arriving aren't exactly what we expected, the man gulped. Sengoku's eyebrow went up as he murmured, isn't it just a marine fleet from G5? There are the battleships from G5, but that's not the problem. The two admirals moved to the left side of the ship as they saw the line of ships arrive. There were at least 50 ships. Basara's mouth dropped and Sengoku's eyes widened. 20 of the 50 ships hailed the marine's flag, which was to be expected but the other 30 ships were the cause of concern. The ship that led the other 30 had a wide sail with a logo printed on it. It was a weird eye-like symbol that had six other circles of unique designs around it. Near that ship were tens of other symbols that the two men immediately recognized. What is this? Basara roared out as he saw the tens of ships with non-marine emblems. Why would the fleet admiral send that filth here? Basara was ready to raise mountains in anger but was stopped by his colleague. Basara San, though I am as confused as you are, but don't forget the Kong San's words. The one eyed marine reluctantly yielded as his eye narrowed upon the man that stood at the helm of the leading ship. He had a red cloak that seemed to glow a sizzling red draped over his whole person. In addition, he wore a matching red hood and a silver mask that hid his face. Of all the unorthodox support we could get, why is it the shadows of the underworld? Sengoku sighed indignantly, his identity was unknown to the public but feared by most nobles around the seas. He was, Devil's Architect, Fulcrum, Dash, back at Apollo Island was a departing ship, it was Big Mom's four children who had filled up their ride with as much gold as they could hold without risking the ship. Katakori had a feeling that he was being watched and yet could find no proof of such a thing. Though as the saying goes, Never discredit your gut intuition. After all, even the walls can grow ears when you deal with certain foes. And it was just like the young pirate thought as, upon their leave, a purple shadow rose out of the distant darkness caused by a large tree. The person's body was wrapped in a tight, leather outfit and an assassin's hood. Though from afar it was easy to identify the body to belong to a woman. She eyed the leaving ship and disappeared back into the darkness. Dash. At another area side of Apollo Island was beach-like terrain near the shore. However, most of it was filled with broken debris and other trash from the earlier fights. It goes to show just how far the area of effect spans when such a war is waged, 
especially considering Apollo Island was far above Glint Island. From the shadow cast by a broken sail rose the same woman as she seemed a little fidgety and expectant of something. Though she was masked, you could see the joy pass through her person as she saw a flash of red on the horizon. Thud, a rumble took the land as a young man of nearly towering stature landed on the ground. With his iconic crimson eyes locked on the clothed assassin. I haven't seen you for almost four months, how have you been, princess? The youth asked with a look of affection. Like a bullet. The female assassin whizzed on ahead into Damien's open arms. Damien encircled his arms around the girl who held him tightly, refusing to let go. Under Damien's near eleven-foot-tall frame, the girl was fully enveloped. He let out a let chuckle as he raised an eyebrow in surprise. Hum, Aurora, your body seemed to have developed rather impressively, he muttered as he felt some rather conspicuous twin peaks through the tight assassin attire. It would seem the One Piece world had quite a unique growing period during time skips. Aurora's mask dissolved into purple energy as she seemed to hold on for dear life. I missed you, Damien. Dash. A little while later, Damien sat on a wooden log as he ate a giant piece of meat attached to a thick bone. Munch. After taking a large bite that even Linlin -Lin would be impressed with, Damien said, Oh. Those two have improved so much. Aurora who leaned her head on Damien's shoulders hummed in unmasked joy. Her purple hair flew freely in the wind. Kuzan Kun is still plagued with constant desire to laze around but he has put more effort since you left, he's a good child. Mahak Chan, I still feel like he's too young for such dangerous weapons, a four-year-old. Sigh, but even so, he's very studious and punctual with his training. Never to miss a single day. Damien nodded in satisfaction. The girl continued with a soft smile, Toki has also been studying all the books you gave, her, she misses you too. The red-eyed youth squinted his eyes, hum, I need to go on a little trip to gain something new, I'll also make a little detour back to Mortem Island then. He then looked at the girl, did you collect the stuff I asked you about? Aurora smiled in response, of course, everything is ready. Asterisk grew, the two then stepped into the world of night, disappearing wholly from the scene. Within the world of night was a bizarre ether. It was an infinite mist of purple energy. Being in this realm allowed him to walk the earth in a separate plane of existence. Damien always felt quite amazed by the versatility of devil fruits. After ten or so minutes, the two reached a large hall that was swamped with items. I went through Soleil Fort, Solis Fort and even the Helios capital treasuries. I collected what I could. Damien nodded. He did send Aurora to ransack the Overlord as much as possible. She then shook her head with a light sigh, unfortunately where there are pirates, there are traitors. As soon as Saul was being overwhelmed, people on the inside turned against him. I took as much as I could find but some of the major holds were broken before I could get there. Damien chuckled as he kissed Aurora on the top of her head. Don't worry, you are only one person, just this amount is already a lot. Aurora gave a faint nod and went on, as for Apollo Island, a few of Big Mom's children got to it first, they took a devil fruit and a portion of the gold. They are still in my range, I can go get them back if you want, Damien. A fruit, Damien hummed in curiosity, no worries, dear, I have a feeling I know what fruit it is. Let's see what you did. Find, Aurora nodded and she waved her hand. Asterisk corrupt. Purple mist from all around the realm warped into the treasure stack, sorting and organizing the loot. A soft hum went off as the goodies were placed in order and tidiness. Now, let's see what we have here. There were a few major things. Devil fruits. Famed blades. A historical poneglyph. Wood from the treasure tree Adam. Gold. Lots of gold. Rare artifacts. A few eternal poses. Damien nodded at the eight devil fruits as his attention was turned to giant blue stone nearby. The poneglyph. His eyes widened in surprise, how interesting. Dash. A few kilometers away, Sengoku stood with a grim expression as he looked at the woman that stood not so far away. I expected you to come, Suru, but not with such company. The great advisor of the marines sighed in response. We cannot direct any more troops out from the Grand Line. It's too much a risk after losing nearly 20,000 soldiers. The admiral nodded slightly in agreement. This was a special occasion where all the major threats came together, if not for that, Kong San would never allow you five to go. 
With all three admirals deployed alongside Garpin's effort, we had to count on other allies, Suru explained. Basara stood with his arms crossed. Che, so you went to an underworld emperor, he even brought that bastard Morgans here. He roared, that bird brat will eat up this defeat and continue to denounce us in the news. Sengoku drifted his eyes to the allies that stood in the large ship next to them. He saw Fulcrum casually sitting, enjoying the breeze. On the seat across from the emperor was a young bird human. A top official of the world economy newspaper, Morgans. Now, now, Sengoku, Suru-chan, Basara-san, let's all get along. That fulcrum isn't that bad. A rambunctious laugh went off. Sengoku rolled his eyes as he saw Garp in a Hawaiian shirt, lying down on a hammock. Garp you idiot, you're only saying that because he brought you high-quality rice crackers. Suru looked at the horizon, her marine coat flying in the wind. Our failure, as Basara-san puts it, will be highlighted regardless. Therefore Kong San made the choice to salvage what we could, something the public will eat up, fully taking control of an overlord territory, liberating 300,000 people, capturing tens of thousands of new world pirates. It makes for a good headline, especially with Morgans being the author, Zephyr's voice came in. He stood with his usual marine shirt and coat, his muscles ever vibrant. Suru nodded, we needed more people for such a large territory. She then looked at Fulcrum not so far away. That's when, conveniently enough, the Devil's Architect voiced his support. A strong order was issued from the Celestial Dragons to which Kong San relented. A defeating silence ensued between top marines as they all fell into thought. With Fulcrum's 10,000 support squads and the remaining marines, it was plausible to gain a firm grip on the remnant forces of Superbia. Why is Fulcrum so vocal of his support? What does he stand to gain? Zephyr questioned. He made a deal. He lent us 10,000 men to quell the disorder at Superbia at the condition that all the gold and other material goods that aren't banned by the government shall fall into his hands. With the support of nearly all of the Celestial Dragon's families, it wasn't something we could disagree with. Suru answered. At this point, one of the top marine powerhouses could not hold it in. Rumble. The ground beneath the endless waters started to shake and rumble about. Many were alarmed as they felt huge ripples of waters as large waves were released as giant swirls of earth rose out. Basara raised his arms out as. The earth moved as he willed. Stop, Basara San. Sengoku yelled out, but it was to no avail. Stooping so low to work with the filth that hides in the shadow of the night, ha. Huh? Tell Kong San I will personally take down all of Superbia myself, but before that, I will take out this vermin myself. Dreaded devastation. Under the shocked eyes of the top marines, the giant ever-warping earth was shaped into a large spear of 300 meter width that was shot forth at Fulcrum's ship. Sengoku was about to take action but saw something else. Crackle. A loud thunderous sound of lightning blew out from Fulcrum's body. Asterisk biz. Arcs of fluid red lightning zapped around his crimson cloak as he stood before the coming attack. Fulcrum raised his hand out as great amounts of lightning shot out, frying and blazing through the air. Boom. In a clash of two elements, the rocky attack was utterly annihilated. Asterisk VZZZ. In a burst of electrical discharge, the underworld emperor disappeared from his ship and directly a few feet above the admiral. Don't be so hard-headed, Admiral Dono. Crimson discharge. Tempest assault. Fulcrum's body turned into full chaotic crimson lightning as his fist smashed upon the admiral without mercy. Under Basara's hockey, the two clashed on. B -o, 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 o M. With the relentless forces of the two powers, powerful shock waves were sent out. Ripples of energy waved out in a grand spectacle, stunning all those present. The fruit lost for over 150 years, to think it fell into the hands of the underworld scum. The admiral spat out. Fulcrum's erratic voice seemed slightly playful. Now, now, don't be so spiteful. It'll lead to early wrinkles. Boom. The admiral was sent back a few meters while Fulcrum elementalized ten or so meters away. The invincible Logia, the rumble rumble fruit. A marine yelled out, enough, Fulcrum, a stern voice went off. Sengoku walked ahead of Basara, the navy will hold up to the deal, you can collect the gold and material wealth on your own. But only after the civilians and pirates have been secured. Fulcrum stood there, a few meters in the air, his mask as mysterious as ever. 
Very well. Let us sail right away. Chapter 116. How very interesting. What is it, Damien? Aurora asked from the side as she saw her lover's grin. It details the existence of three islands capable of determining the fate of the world, the three endpoints. Damien then began to summarize the records of the Poneglyph. It states they emerged during the end of the void century when the untold horrors and major taboos took place. A powerful man who had the ability to mold the world commanded an exuberant amount of subterranean magma and sealed it in three islands of the new world. Aka, the three endpoints. Damien tapped his chin in thought, should all three islands be destroyed, the seal will be undone, releasing enough magma to wash away the entire world in molten rocks and the lives within. Aurora took an audible gulp, stepping back in shock. So, it can end the world. Yep, Damien replied. Anyways, let's see what fruits we have here. Quote ellipsis quote. Aurora was left speechless as Damien casually went on to analyze the fruits. Dash. Zone. Bat bat fruit. Model horseshoe bat. Cat cat fruit. Model lynx. Human human fruit. Model otaku. Bird bird fruit. Model hawk. Dash. Paramecia. Fix fix fruit. Allows the user to fix all material faults determined by the user's thoughts. Author author fruit. Allows the user to write significantly faster. Hair hair fruit. Allows the user to fully control all hair follicles within their body. Truth truth fruit. Allows the user to harvest the truth from anyone. Dash. Well, one of them has some use but the rest aren't overly. Impressive. It's a gamble after all. Damien then moved to the three-famed blade. A trashy skillful blade, I might make a spoon out of it, he said as he tossed one of them to the side. Hmm, this isn't bad. Damien inspected the great grade sword. Aurora, who had recovered from knowing about the three switches of death, turned her attention to Damien. A playful smile appeared on her face as if she was waiting for something. Clank. Damien threw another skillful grade sword, next to the pile of useless fruits harvested from earlier. Though at this point, he had noticed Aurora's proud expression. What's up with you? Ahem, well I found another treasure that Saul had stored in his private collection, she said. I was saving it for last. Damien raised an eyebrow as a small smirk came to his face. He vanished from his position and appeared behind the purple-haired girl and tied his hands around and over her shoulder and across her body. Oh, don't keep me in suspense. Aurora's face reddened slightly as she waved her hand as a storm of purple energy rained down from above. Asterisk Vu, it was a vortex of night energy that hit a powerful artifact. This feeling, Damien uttered as his eyes widened in surprise. You've found quite the treasure for me, princess. He kissed her cheek and walked ahead into the purple mass of energy. Creaking. A familiar sound breached Damien's ears as he heard ice form and expand around the object. Asterisk foo. It floated with grace and beauty, exuding both strength and power. A katana-like sword with an uneven blade, as if carved by a child. And yet it sent out a feeling of unfound sharpness. Apart from the glacial blue color and uneven blade, it also released white mist, as one exhales during the cold. Well considering it is the holy terror, prized possession, it would make sense for him to have this, Damien muttered. As the sword before him was one of the thirteen supreme blades, the blessed blade, Hyoga. Aurora who admired the blade from afar took out a small book called the famed blade records. It detailed all of the known fifty skillful grade swords, the twenty-five great grade swords and the thirteen supreme grade swords, it was only recently updated to include Yushi. Asterisk FWAH. She flipped through the pages and found it. The Blessed Blade, Hyoga, she read off. According to the historians at Ohara, the sword was forged in the icy plains of the Everwinter Island over 650 years ago. It was made with heavenly ore that was bathed in a frozen lake to ward off devil fruit users. She went on to say, according to the text here, the blade of the sword supposedly gives off a wavelength that is the same as the sea itself. With this power to fight the devil, it was given the label as the Blessed Blade. Damien nodded at the information, hmm, let's test the theory. Asterisk corrupt, like a bubbly mass, pulverizing energy appeared in Damien's hand. He directed the energy towards the sword. As the crimson haze neared the blade, it started to vibrate, seemingly alive as white mist exuded out. Sizzle, and like water on a hot pan, 
the entire crushing red power was removed and utterly disintegrated. Hmm, theoretically it shouldn't even be able to be in this world of night since it is made from a devil fruit but I guess being the blessed blade, it has its own mind. Step. Damien walked up and grabbed the brown hand. As expected, the weapon shook while endless icy breaths raged out and into Damien's hand. His palm creaked as the cold feeling ran through his body. Ice formed upon the young pirate's wrist as if trying to freeze it straight to the marrow. I'll find you a fitting wielder to showcase your grace and strength, until then, sleep. Being a sentient blade, Damien, expected continued resistance. However, the blade stopped its initial struggle and sat softly in the young pirate's hand. Calm as day, Damien raised an eyebrow in interest, wondering why the blade gave up like so, almost as if it recognized him. But he didn't think much of it as he stored the icy sword into his inventory. The Sin Incarnate then turned his attention to the purple-haired princess behind him and gave a wolfish grin. Now, Aurora, since you tried so hard, it's time for your reward. Damien walked forwards with a smirk that caused the girl to freeze. D don't you have to return to Hashinosu. She gulped under the boy's gaze that seemed rather hungry. Damien moved the purple strands of hair in front of the girl's face as he grasped her in a powerful hold. There's no real, we've got all the time in the world. Aurora could no longer resist as her lips were taken and her mind drifted elsewhere, outside of mundane thoughts. Dash. Later on. More than half a day had passed as the marines had invaded the country. It wasn't a surprise when the admirals found the destroyed forts and walls alongside the majority of the prideful pirates being dead. What did surprise them was that so many of them were cruelly drained of life, turned to bones and nothing but fleeting minerals. A horrifying image to say the least. Over the twelve or so hours, Sengoku, Garp and Zephyr went scouring the entirety of Superbia, clearing endless collapsed buildings, landmarks and even mountains. In the wake of the pirate fest, huge waves and tsunamis had graced the island, leaving it in dust and rubble. Of the 300,000 civilians, at least 40% died from such causes while many were left injured and in a critical state. The 10,000 of Fulcrum's men and remaining marines went through and helped bring the injured and dead into a single place. It was a long process, but with Basara the mountain, transportation wasn't difficult. Suru used her wash wash fruit to purify the pirates that remained while the vice admirals rounded up the few veteran pirates who survived. It was a long process but it was necessary, after all, the marines were the good guys. Dash, Kong San, I didn't ask then, but the celestial dragons, what's going on with them? Sengoku asked over the snail, why would they support Fulcrum so much? Kong's usual stern voice responded, a very grand and secretive event will happen soon, Sengoku. The leaders of each of the 19 royal families have voiced the desire to calm the seas as soon as possible. And so, Fulcrum, the man who controls much of the underworld is being favored by them. With Saul dead, Lord knows what hell is to follow, but one thing is for sure, the world nobles are afraid. The fleet admiral sighed in resignation. I see you as my successor, Sengoku. Just do as you're tasked, don't ask too many questions and my seat will be yours eventually. Dash. Room of Authority, Pangea Castle. Five men rest in the Room of Authority. They are the supreme authority of the world government. Dash. The Sword Elder slightly unsheathed his supreme sword, Shodai Kidetsu. Balance has been tipped. The world is left hanging by a thin thread of order that weakens. The Blonde Elder sighed as he massaged his temples. With Soul's downfall. A vacuum of power has appeared in the new world. From one D to another. Zebek, Roger, Damien. All of these are far too dangerous to be left alive any longer. The scarred elder raged out, all our efforts have been voided by that damn rock's pirates. The fateful day approaches and we lose more and more control by the passing second. Asterisk Sheing, the sword elder fully releases his sword as his eyes grow heavy in distress. Zebek has gotten stronger and that Roger has gotten far too close to the final island. He then said, and that boy, Ina D. Damien, his father was just as problematic as he has now become. To think his power can be used just as Vegapunk estimated, how truly dreadful. Another elder interjected, the D will always blow up a storm. It was a mistake on our part to let him grow. The little seed left behind by Ares has sprouted and grown into an entity that seems to only know how to oppose order. 
The voice then grew solemn as a sharp glint flooded the eyes of the elders. Perhaps it is time to extinguish another light from history once again. Quote dot 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 quote. A deafening silence pervaded the atmosphere as each elder was left solemn. The bearded elder spoke up, what of Kong's request? I say it may be of some use and can increase our control over the new world. Kong is too reckless, if he's given the approval to use them then it may very well blow back in our faces, the bald elder voiced out his opinion. The blonde elder shook his head, then let us have Xerxes and his CP0 oversee it. They will ensure that it stays in our hands. Clank. The sword elder sheathed his sword once more in agreement, it is decided then, Xerxes will be tasked to go to Jail Island and get the excavation method himself. We put the issue aside before but their use has come earlier than expected. The scarred elder harumped, very well, for the greater good, the Dina stones shall be used to quell the disorder of the new world. Dash. Moments later, in the white halls of a decorated office came a snail call. To think they would approve of it so soon, a man thought out loud as he put out his cigar. The Dina stones are said to equal the ancient weapons. I suppose it is only natural that they should belong to the reliable hands of the world government. The man talking was the chief of cipher pole, Xerxes. Pronounced as Xerxes. As for the Dina stones, they are found exclusively on Jail Island to which only the inhabitants know the way to properly extract them. With the strength to rival the likes of the ancient weapons, well, gaining the excavation method needed some blood to be spilled. Xerxes understood this very well, in the name of justice. Dash. While the orders that decided the fate of the world were being sent out, Damien was finishing up some personal business. Ha. Who? Ha. Soft yet heavy breaths escaped from a purple-haired girl's mouth. She was clearly quite spent. Damien, you should be gentler with girls, she sighed in fleeting pleasure as her breathing slowly stabilized. The red-eyed young man gave out a smirk, well, both Toki and you tell a different tale during our little contests compared to what you say after it. Aurora turned away, her face flushed in indignation. Dot dot dot. A few silent seconds later, Damien felt a tremor in Aurora's body, she seemed to be in deep thought. He quickly deduced what had taken over the girl's mind. I left him in quite a broken shape. Once he wakes up he will surely wish that he'd died in that explosion. I'll let you kill him yourself once you're strong enough. Damien said as he played with Aurora's long purple hair in a soothing voice. It seemed to work as the girl turned over with a soft yet affectionate smile, I know, I trust you. Damien smiled as he got up to leave the world of night. Be careful. The sin incarnate gave out a chuckle as he lowered his head and kissed the girl once more. Don't worry, I'll be fine, he said. I'll count on Toki and you to take care of the kids. I'm afraid the seas will only get more turbulent from now on. Dash, quahahaha, big news, big news galore, a shrill voice cackled, on the ruined streets of Helios capital was a single humanoid bird that scribbled endless notes on a small pad in his feathery hands, I'll write the most spectacular report that can be written, don't you worry, fulcrum, Morgans assured the man who walked beside him, very good, I'll leave that to you, Morgans, crackle, in a red arc of electricity, the man disappeared, Asterisk BZZZ. Fulcrum then reappeared on a lonely mountain top that overlooked the fallen overlord land. A handful of posters in his hands. They were pre published bounty posters that Morgans had given him, they were to be sent out with the final report. Fulcrum gave out a hum as he flipped through the pages. A few draft posters were laid out, supposedly sent to Morgans to include in his report. These bounties are rather high, I guess the world government has become impatient with that event you to happen soon. Dash. Author note. The three endpoints and Dina stones are from the One Piece movie Z the same one where Zephyr was introduced. It is non-canon but it's some interesting stuff. Kyoga means, Glacier, if you didn't know. Chapter 117. It was the early morning of August 22nd of the year 1485. Most people had woken up, had a nice breakfast, and waited for the daily news to arrive. And it did. Yet it came with such a storm that left even the newborn babies in disarray. It was widely known that the 32nd Pirate Festival had occurred just four days ago, on the 18th. It was a feared event. Anytime large amounts of pirate crews came together signaled a joyous spectacle. And joyful pirates tend to do things they enjoy, 
which almost always comes at the expense of the innocent. Over 11 years ago when the 31st Pirate Festival was held, the New World felt a spike in deaths and destruction and led to enormous casualties. However since then, the marine presence had increased, just recently there was a huge flux of recruits worldwide. Tens of thousands flocked in from all the seas both in and outside the Grand Line. Headed by powerful admirals and vice-admirals, things had mellowed down. Even two overlords had fallen. Yet two months ago, the invincible power of the marines was left shaken. It was a greatly publicized event that had gone down and led to a defeated admiral and the destruction of a navy stronghold, G2. The names of the Rock's pirates had ballooned out once more after the angelic war once the Sin Incarnate laid siege upon the marine base. So when the pirate festival was announced, naturally the world was left shaken in trepidation. Roger pirates, prideful pirates, Rock's pirates. Three major forces were said to come together, who wouldn't be worried? Could the Navy hold up against such disasters? Alas, the news update had arrived. Dash, Sabayadi Archipelago. The streets were packed, as usual, at least the areas where the pirates were suppressed. The shops were filled, as usual, business was booming for wandering merchants. Tens of thousands were present all around the island. Being the island at the center of the Grand Line with access to the New World, Paradise, Mariajoy, and Fishman Island kept the population growing constantly. Yet the worried glances of the older folks remained as the pirates hid too, waiting for the coming storm. Flutter. In the dazzling mangroves of Sabayati came a rain of pages. Eyes drifted up as the seagulls brought the much-awaited news. Shocked gasps went off one by one as the headlines were read. The Scorched Sea War. Closing square bracket. It documented the start of the festival to the very end. Pictures of Seoul's arrival, the six capital vices, the endless sea of pirates. Images of the rocks, arrival were then shown. Prideful pirates versus the New World's pirates. Roger versus Whitebeard, Shaki versus Redfield, Damien versus Saul. These three were the major duels documented on the first day of the festival. Pictures of Seoul's magnificent zone form were followed by the clash between Damien and Rayleigh versus the Holy Terror. Hadeen form made its debut. Such a horrifying appearance was enough to make the little girls cry while the boys were left feeling admiration. Dash, such a young man can cause so much terror. A widow yelled out in shock. It was a widely accepted notion that made its way through the minds of the masses. Especially as Seoul's initial defeat was shown. When the report finally got to the end and the majesty of the explosion was shown, well, it caused a major panic. Seeing tens of thousands marines led by five admiral-level powers being enveloped in such an apocalyptic sight was enough to cause hyperventilation. The nuke unleashed was surely the major instant where the tides had shifted. Even the nannies had begun to use Damien's name as some sort of monster to quiet their kids. And of course, Zebek's victory against Saul also made its way to the top of the report. At least the navy was able to save many of the innocents of Superbia. A man exclaimed. His companion nodded, thankfully Sengoku-sama was there. A woman on the side also added her bit, it's good that over 30,000 pirates fell at such a terrible event. One less pirate is one more innocent saved. Due to the government's deal with Morgans, they did save some of their reputation as the world's guardians. Hundreds of thousands were saved and tens of thousands of pirates were either dead or imprisoned. But that didn't stop the names of the Roger pirates and Rocks pirates to echo in everyone's minds especially with the attached posters. Dash. Firstly, the minor bounties. Wanted. Zenora Indra. Swift death. 666 million. Dead or alive. Wanted. Shikuyaku. Black death. 833,330,000. Dead or alive. Wanted. Silver axe. Blinding light. 930 million. Dead or alive. Wanted. Kaido. Kaido of the beasts. 1,261,110,000. Dead or alive. Dash. These numbers alone would strike fear into the eyes of the people. Even exceeding 300 million berries would be considered a great feat before entering the chaotic seas of the New World. And yet, compared to the true forces of terror, these numbers were still far too little. When it came to the Roger Pirates, they were a pirate crew that had recently made huge tides even before the Scorched Sea War. Their feet, conquering the Grand Line, 
It was said that they had reached the final island documented on the log post trials, Lodestar Island. Their names had already spread far and wide with the current top three officers being hailed as great threats. Wanted. Stopper Gabon. Twin Axe. 1,370,550,000. Dead or Alive. Wanted. Silvers Rayleigh. Dark King. 2,558,600,000. Dead or Alive. Wanted. G.O.L.D. Roger. The Mad King. 4,064,800,000. Dead or alive, dash, good lord, F4 billion, a man cried out as his body fell with a thud from sheer shock. Not even the three overlord of the sea had managed to enter the 4 billion range, causing quite the uproar. Only that demon Zebek has been given such a number, an experienced bounty hunter commented with a solemn tone. Sabayati Archipelago was quite familiar with the entire world, being at the practical center of it. K. Keep reading. The next part is entirely on the rocks pirates. Flutter. Pages were flipped aggressively as another collection of bounties were shown with their own separate descriptions. With the numbers written in their usual bold and eye-drawing font, it was enough to cause an island-wide silence. The extended report mainly focused on the current pirate crew with the greatest threat to the order of the world and the safety of its people. Known for their infamous endless strength and lack of camaraderie, they were practically a coming of natural disasters. They had been in the news since the Water 7 incident followed up by the Sabodi Archipelago upset where three world nobles were left dead. Somehow they were connected to the fall of the three overlords and were practically the ones who took them down. Apart from the numbers already shown earlier on, this entire section of the report detailed the top pillars of the crew, the four titans and their captain. Firstly, she is known for her great beauty and world-class figure. Yet with that attraction came great dread. A woman with a bottomless belly that could destroy a village of Elbaf as a child, a true monster. Wanted. Charlotte Linlin. Evil Sprit. 2,799,388,000. Dead or alive. Dash. The next man was known for his rather overwhelming strength all the while holding the power that could destroy the world. His name has remained ingrained in the minds of the masses since he alone took down the overlord, Esso Borealis. Wanted. Edward Newgate, Whitebeard, 3,291,046,000. Dead or alive, dash, beyond that was a man with just as much a terrifying fruit power. With his float float fruit, he could send entire islands into the sky. He was known for his great arrogance and strength and was widely renowned as a masterful dual-wielding swordsman. Wanted, Shaki, Golden Lion, The Flying Pirate. 3,304,990,000. Dead or alive, dash, the penultimate poster was that of a name that dominated much of the report. It wasn't for some experienced pirate with decades of training but rather for a young man. His days began as an apprentice on the rock's ship. He made his way through the rankings and arrived as the 5th Division commander. What followed was pure anarchy. He took down the overlord with a bounty of above 3 billion, Thaddeus Enigma caused the West Blue Massacre, destroyed G4 and disarmed Vice Admiral Zephyr, was the mastermind of the Amethyst Island Crisis, brought about a new Supreme Blade, defeated the Navy Admiral, Basara the Mountain, and destroyed G2, and just recently fended off Pride D, Saul alongside the Dark King, fought toe-to-toe -to -toe with Vice Admiral Garp, but worst of all, he somehow held the power to cause an instant defeat for the Marines, leaving them in horrible shape. The talks about the nuclear bomb were not hidden, alongside the collapse of another Admiral Kurawashi. Wanted. Ina D. Damien. Damien the Undying. Sin Incarnate. 3,387,600,000. Dead or Alive. Image. Dash. And lastly, the man who stood at the helm of all these walking terrors. The supreme commander of the Rock's Pirates and the one who had slain the prideful overlord. With his savage look and superior strength, he was surely the worst of the worst. He was everything a pirate entailed and far more. His name and appearance alone caused 200 reported heart attacks over the world at a yearly basis. The death toll to his madness was in the millions. Wanted. Rox D. Zebek, The Great Essen. 4,670,500,000. Only dead. Dash. At a church in Grove 67. An elderly man wearing the attire of a priest knelt down before a large statue. Tens of nuns did the same behind him. 
Behind them were over 300 people of varying ages, all mimicking the motion of the Pope at the front. A few bounty posters were laid on the ground before the mass of faithful believers. O Divine One, have mercy on our souls and send these devils to the deepest pits of the afterworld. Please Lord. Dash. Similar scenes occurred throughout the world, whether it was the four outer seas, paradise or the new world. People were afraid and they went to where they felt safe. Some prayed to God, some accepted reality, and some were so afraid that their minds forced them to go to the local brothel. Their primal instinct to procreate and continue their family line was awakened in the fear of death. Look, they updated the threat index. The threat index was a list of criminals categorized into six levels. Level 6 threats not worth mentioning by higher powers. Level 5 emerging threats, usually supernovas of their respective eras. Level 4 threats known for their brutality and destruction, usually only from the new world. Level 3 threats that could cause the collapse of smaller kingdoms. Level 2 threats that could be said to bring enough destruction that would warrant the eyes of navy admirals. Usually pirates with at least a billion berry bounty. Level 1 the absolute terrors of current times. Anyone names found in this list were an instant no-no. They had either the power or the capital to cause untold amounts of chaos. The world government will have to send out great amounts of forces to even attempt to take down any of those who belong to this level. The level 1 threats are usually the ones most discussed in the reverie as many major kingdoms remain wary of them. Pirate Queen, Herja, Crazed Wind, Borealis, Enigma the, Chessmaster, the, Holy Terror, Saul. All these monsters were in that list until their fall. A man shouted out as he looked over the new list. Of the nine names in the first level of the threat index, eight of them were involved in the recent war. Those eight being, 1. Charlotte Linlin, 2. Silvers Rayleigh, 3. Patrick Redfield, 4. Edward Newgate, 5. Shaki, 6. Ina D. Damien, 7. Gall D. Roger, 8. Rox D. Zebek and of course, the D middle name was not exactly invisible. Even an idiot could see the reappearances of this name as four had already made their way to the first level. It was another thought for the reverie scheduled in three years. Dash. A few hours later. Ha ha. I can't believe so much happened at that festival, a man sighed as he sat down. His heart finally calmed down from the news report. Who could have expected the marines to lose so many troops in a single attack, what a tragedy. Even the dazzling Kurawashi-sama was left so broken. Why do all the handsome guys have to be villains? A teenage girl cried out as she held a bounty poster. Ellipsis. Conversations broke out as the scorched sea war had become a heavily talked about topic. The major topic being, who won? On one side, over 50,000 pirates were wiped out alongside a terrifying overlord. And these weren't your run-up-the-mill pirates either, they were the scum of the new world. Such a huge purge was always welcomed. On the other side, over 120,000 civilians died at just Superbia and many other nearby islands were also hit with giant tides and powerful shockwaves. The Navy also took nearly 20,000 losses alongside the destruction of the fabled Ox Lloyd's warship. Furthermore, an admiral was left in critical condition. So at the end of the day, was it really a victory for the people? The last remaining overlord fell in yet afar far more frightening pirate crew seemed to take their place. Another new topic and a cause of fear was connected to a single saying, there can only be one king. With the order of the overlords being a thing of the past, only two real crews remain. The Rocks Pirates and the Roger Pirates. It wasn't a reach to say that another world-shaking war was due. Dash. Hey did you hear about the giant hole left in from the war? A man remarked. His friend nodded with some fascination. I wanna go see it myself. A landmark left behind by the scorched sea war. The man nodded. I hear they're calling it one of the seven wonders of the new world. Chapter 118. A week later. Marine Ford. Simple brick design. Tall walls. Navy markings. And flags. A large building off the side of the main headquarters. It was at the Marine Ford General Hospital. Ah. Uh, a suppressed cry of untold pain rang out. Masao San. You must rest. A doctor yelled in a panic as he saw his patient attempt to stand up. What happened to me? The marine roared out as he felt great pain all over. Why you were out in critical condition for days? Your body. Kurawashi's hand shot out as it grabbed the doctor by the throat. I've been injured many times, 
The man spat out as his body started shaking in pain once more. Why does everything hurt so much? Kurawashi was currently wrapped in bandages all over, leaving just his orifices unrestricted. Bam! It was a loud bang that erupted as the door to the ward was slammed open. A burly man with thick muscles and a body that seemed to be the epitome of power walked in. Enough! Masao, put the doctor down. Kong San, Gu, Kurawashi once again winced in pain as he fell to his bed. Step. A few rhythmic steps went off as another, a much smaller man walked in. He had messy hair, a thick black mustache. He also wore a long white coat with a few tools draped around his neck. The man seemed to be in his mid-twenties. Vegapunk, tell him, he is known for having a genius mind that was supposedly 500 years beyond current technology. The genius, Dr. Vegapunk. Masao Kun, how do I put it? Hum, your body, well, it's in quite bad shape. Vegapunk was about to elaborate however he was interrupted. Wahahaha, you look like a mummy, Masao. Garp walked in with his casual marine get up, snacking on some rice crackers. Be serious, Garp, a man with a thick metal arm yelled out. After a week since Fulcrum's aid, Garp and Zephyr were recalled to HQ alongside the wounded admiral. Kong gave out a loud sigh as he gestured towards the genius doctor to continue. As I was saying, your body took the brunt of the explosion. Apart from having your inner organs rattled by the shockwaves, you were also bathed in an inferno, Vegapunk said. Just a few months ago I filed a report for every major threat as directed by the fleet admiral. The pulverized pulverized fruit should be able to divide things into smaller parts including the building blocks of our universe. It seems that the young pirate has done exactly that to some radioactive ore. The scientist then seemed to fall into his own world as he brought together his fingers with a grin, it really makes things easier if I could use that in my experiments, ho ho ho. How enviable. Kong coughed rather boldly in an attempt to wake up the doctor. Vegapunk straightened his coat and nodded professionally, ah, as I was saying. It seems like the radiation from the blast was absorbed into your skin when you used Tekai of the Rokushiki and it left some problems. The doctor took out a clipboard and read off some side effects. Fourth degree burns, greatly scarred appearance, permanent hair loss, shortened lifespan, constant and uncontrollable growth of cells in certain areas, erectile dysfunction, extreme sensitivity to sunlight, and a tortuous itch that may never go away. Vegapunk then seemed solemn as he broke the news, I'm afraid you've arrived at the stage where the living would envy the dead. Quote dot 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 quote. A deafening silence broke out as Kurawashi soaked in the dire news, his body still rattled in pain. Even Garp lowered his bag of crackers and seemed to salute the man with a slow nod. While the broken admiral was lost in thought, still absorbing the information, another man spoke up. It seems rather intentional, no. I never saw that young man be so unforgiving, Zephyr said. Garp, who stood beside him, just waved his hand in dismissal. Eh, didn't, he take your arm and Basara's eye. They're even calling him the, Admiral Slayer. The others slightly nodded at the title the young generation of the marines had given Damien. All the while Garp was on a completely different frequency. The vice admiral then grumbled out, that golden bastard Sengoku dared to cut down my cracker budget, ha. Huh? I can't wait to see what that Damien boy will take from him. Zephyr, you have a guess? Kong asked, still regretful as he saw his subordinate in terrible shape. Zephyr slowly nodded, if I remember correctly, Kurawashi-kun was the one deployed to execute the royal family of Amethyst Kingdom for committing the taboo of translating poneglyphs. He then touched his cold, metallic arm, a year ago when he took my arm, he also saved the lost princess, Amethyst Aurora. It's not hard to make the connection. Kong nodded in understanding. Ah. Uh, a groan resounded the ward. Kong San, let me go and hunt that sin incarnate down. I'll pay him back for all of this. Kurawashi's eyes seemed fueled with a burning vengeance as they had now become a villainous yellow. Flutter. In the hasty cry, the admiral's facial bandages fell off, revealing the altered visage hidden beneath. He was called the dazzling admiral, who commanded the fabled Ox Lloyd's warship. The ladies of the marine chased him around while the man bathed him in admiration. Yet he was now reduced to a bald and whitened face, lacking his former glory, scarred and decrepit. Kurawashi had now stood up with burning eyes. 
Yet those vengeful eyes dimmed in pain as his body was struck by a ray of sunlight. Ah, uh, ow, he roared out, feeling the kiss of the sun on his arm. Vegapunk shook his head, the burns of your skin will leave you restless. It's best to remain away from it. He then rubbed his chin in thought, maybe a lightweight metal suit would suffice. Kong had made his mind and gave out his orders. Masao, you are to remain here till you've healed, Vegapunk will work on your skin condition. But I don't want any thoughts of revenge right now, remember your position as an admiral. Kurawashi grinded his teeth as grains of enamel fell. The man simply nodded helplessly and laid back down. Thud. The door closed once again as the men then walked out from the silent room and into the hallway. Garp, Zephyr, remain vigilant for any movement from the rocks. I have to report to Endo-san about Masao's condition in person. Garp causally picked his nose and asked, Eh, hey, you want to go to the big boss in person for that? The fleet admiral solemnly nodded, I hope it doesn't happen but depending on his actions, Masao may lose his position as an admiral. Zephyr gave an audible hum while Garp just yawned in response as the men went off to their own devices. Dash, elsewhere, Woro Ro Ro, Rahahaha, Yufu Fu Fu, two booming laughs in unison with a soft giggle resounded the seas. It was upon the majesty of the Titanic that it originated from. While the four laughed, the nearby pirates gulped in fear, their minds flooded with the instinct to escape. After all, the one they laughed at seemed ready to explode any second. Newgate Austin, Damien wiped a tear from his eye. I didn't know you had a mistress you hid from us. Woro ro ro. Damien and Kaido shook the floorboards as even Shaki seemed to join in. Newgate, if you wanted a woman you should have come to me. Lin Lin offered from the side. Edward Newgate, the man with the power to destroy the world, stood at the center of the ship. His eyes shut while veins popped all over his face. The mighty weapon in his hand carried the same rage as it visibly shook. Like I said, you brats. He roared out, I have nothing to do with this woman. He then, pointed out his bisanto at a female by the side. She was around five feet tall and had golden hair. Rather prominent rosy lips and sunglasses that hid her eyes. She was called, Miss Bakken. Dash, Damien has recognized her from the One Piece show. She was the self-proclaimed lover of Whitebeard and even said to have had his child, a future warlord of the sea, Edward Weevil. She was also one of the pirates that aligned with the rocks at the Scorched Sea War not long ago. Bakken had told Damien that she was Newgate's, childhood sweetheart, a notion the young man accepted as a fact with a smiling face. Dash, under the giant pirate's infuriated eyes, Damien just waved his hand, don't worry, Austin. No need to be shy about it. Kaido also slammed his club with a booming laugh. Whitebeard raised a fist, asterisk corrupt, a thick, white bubble formed around it that held enough power to level an island. Let me teach you brats some respect. What followed was a few destroyed ships, a few hundred dead pirates and a sky with a giant gash. Bakken nodded, her eyes still hidden behind her glasses, that's my dear beloved. Dash, a while later. Damien sat with the embrace of the rare, gentle wind of the new world, leaning on the mast with the sails nearly 500 feet off the ground. His face was a bit skiffed up, having eaten a few earthquakes would leave anyone with some bruises. He was currently observing two posters, one out of curiosity and the other out of hidden joy. Wanted, Patrick Redfield, the Red Count, aloof Red, 2,273,080,000, dead or alive, wanted. Fulcrum, Devil's Architect, 760 million, dead or alive, dash, when it came to Redfield, Damien was naturally curious. The man was a lone wolf. Yet without a single crewmate, he was able to reach the level of Roger and Shaki. It is not something just anyone could do. Furthermore, he also was the man who brought the news about Damien's father, Ares, to him. As for Fulcrum, well the bounty was to be expected. Even though it was a trade of, equal exchange, with the government, Fulcrum had made a full debut to the world. Plus, he was also known by the nobles of the world as a pillar of the darkness that swarmed about, hidden beneath everything. The word, Fulcrum, itself was a pivot point, an entity that held things in balance. A power that could tip the scales in ways that may scare off many people, even greatly trouble the marines. And he was true that identity, 
If not for the support of the celestial dragons, he would surely have been taken down by now, especially with his rather dangerous fruit power. Well, I'd say it was worth the fruit, Damien mumbled as he recalled a conversation from a while back. Sybil had told him that a clone could eat a devil fruit as it was an individual entity. And by the power of the split split fruit that Damien had, it only splits his abilities, excluding ancient voice. Therefore, rendering Fulcrum as another living being. However, the laws of equal exchange still hold and eating a fruit came with a condition. Which was that he could no longer merge with Fulcrum. A paradox, so to speak. Well, I can't train much more from clone merging. Plus, Fulcrum can be used in other ways, Damien thought. Asterisk Vwu, Damien then took out an object from his inventory. It was a smooth metal that glowed green and pulsed out some nasty energy. Dash, Viridesium ore, a very rare and radioactive mineral. Decays naturally through alpha radiation, allowing it to release copious amounts of heat and energy when its atoms are split. This item has previously been refined. Dash, what a pity that so little was found, Damien shook his head. His supply of viridesium ore was very little. He used nearly half of it in the Scorched Sea War. As for where he found it from, naturally, it was Wano. Relating it to uranium-235 from his previous life wasn't hard, especially with his knowledge of explosives. In addition to that, his nearly awakened powers also worked in tandem with it. However, Sybil wasn't slow to inform him of the rareness of the ore. Damien's eyes then seemed to glow vibrantly in a primal red. His mind seemed to transfer some hidden data. Destiny perceived. Dash. Viridesium ore refined. Age. Hundreds of millennia. History. Naturally occurring in the land of Wano. Was mined endlessly and unsustainably over 800 years ago in the production of a weapon of mass destruction. This action left it in very low amounts. Fate. Remained unmined for another 3,000 years. Death. Due to fully decay in 129,087,793 years. Dash. Damien shook his head, being unable to blow everything up was quite unfortunate. He then pocketed the piece and changed his attention elsewhere. Sybil, bring up my stats, it's been a long arc, he said with a small yawn. And a panel revealed itself before the young man's eyes. Dash. I na d. Damien. Age. 17 years. 6.5 months eternal past 27. Height. 10 feet 11. Status. Beyond healthy. Bloodline. Fishman human hybrid. Physique. Black body. Strength. Up arrow late stages of high tier Yonko. With Hadeen release right pointing arrow early stages of top tier Yonko. Devil fruit. Pulverize pulverize fruit ripe for awakening. Weapon. Yushi of the Supreme Grade Series. Yushi Combat Arts Comprehension. Up arrow 93%. Sea Stone Resistance. Immune. Skills. Hockey Down Arrow. Observation Hockey Mastery. Grand Mastery I. Armament Hockey Mastery. Peak Advanced. Conqueror's Hockey Mastery. Grand Mastery II. Dash. Points Balance. 3631 SP. Many quests available to be claimed. Dash. The list had grown quite long but it was to Damien's satisfaction. His strength had ballooned quite a lot after fighting both Saul and Garp. He had embraced the way of the shonen, pushing oneself to the limit and surpassing and becoming something more. Asterisk Vwu, the air suddenly rumbled and was shredded in a loud groan as Damien's arms burst out in a powerful pulverizing red. Hum, it's ready, now I just need a catalyst. Dash, Captain's Quarters, the Titanic. It was a rather empty yet dark room filled with a stench of death itself. There were cracks all over the room, even the blood ore and its characteristics seemed to decay under the might of a primal force that existed against life itself. A fog of black mist filled the room as two outlines remained visible. So you want to leave, Shikuyaku? A wild and raspy voice questioned. The voice lacked emotion and had nothing more than a sliver of curiosity. The black-haired woman stood rather stiff trying to hide the trepidation in her eyes. She cleared her throat and remained strong, yes, Tycho. Her eyes then cleared as she continued with a determined tone, unlike the others, my reason to sail the seas wasn't for treasure, strength or anything material. I think I have had my fill with the pirate life and would like to retire to something more, mellow. Zebek studied the woman before him. 
His crazed eyes scanned thoroughly. Cold sweat broke out from the woman's neck as her breath grew heavy under the glare of the great sin. Even though the man wasn't trying to be overly malicious, his body naturally released certain wavelengths that anyone else would perceive as fatal. And being stared at by an apex predator was not exactly pleasant. After what seemed like hours to the female pirate, the silence was lifted. Zahaha! All right, little girl. It's not like you drank from the sake cup when you came under me. Though the ship will be louder with you and your little ravens gone. He then returned to his drinking, his mind elsewhere on a different event that would take place not too long from now. Dash. Few days later. A feast was thrown by Damien and Newgate in light of Shaki's departure. Practically everyone with the exception of Zebek joined in. Even with their numbers greatly lessened, they were a large group of men and women who did not get well together. However, the magic cure of alcohol tended to alter that result. It lasted five days and five nights, the entire sea of pirates was left drunk and sleep deprived. That aside, another 650 men died throughout the party whether it was being stabbed while drunk or smashed apart by Kaido, it was nothing new. Dash. It was now a brand new day. Most of the pirates were asleep. The weather was not friendly. Pouring rain and chaotic tides were forecasted. Not something anyone with a hint of IQ would want to sail in. You don't have to come with me, Damien Chan. The black-haired woman smiled towards the younger man beside her. It's nothing much. Plus, I already told the old bastard that I'll be gone for a few months. So I'll take you to Sabayadi too, Shaki Nay. Damien used his weather warping, commanding the skies to clear up and the rain to excuse itself. The two now stood on a small ship, bathed in fresh sunlight and mellow waves. They had begun to sail not long ago, having bid farewell to the others. Though that only included Damien's division mates, Newgate and Andor. As for Shaki's fourth division, it had disbanded. Without her direct supervision, it wasn't worth much. Amber, Shaki's secretary, had also left with some other, ravens. They had promised to keep in touch with the Black Death and to keep a chain of information ready. Shaki's worldwide network of news remained stable. Poof. A cloud of smoke drifted about as the short-haired woman sat on the railing of the ship. She wore her usual with long legs revealed in their full glory. Where do you plan to go? She then gave him a teasing grin, Eratilda, could it be to meet your two little sweethearts you told me about? Damien, who was leaning against the mast, gave out a cough, well, no, not yet anyway. Before that, I want to venture to another hell hole in the new world. Shaki raised an eyebrow, well don't keep in suspense. Damien let out a grin, I recently arrived at a bit of a block in my fruit powers. I just need a little push. Shaki tapped her chin and remarked, you don't mean. Damien nodded as he saw her expression, that's right, I want to go to the Isle of Disasters, Extinction Valley. Chapter 119, Squawk. A cheery morning rose in the mellow lands of Sabayati Archipelago. The people were embraced in the warm rays as the birds did their usual flyover. It was peaceful, the crowd was bursting as usual. Some pirates could be seen here and there. Perhaps it was due to the serene weather or perhaps that the celestial dragons had stopped appearing beyond the safe walls of Mariajoy for a few weeks now. And under the unsuspecting eyes of the public, two people walked through the mangroves. One seemed like a woman, her head covered with a hood while wearing a loose cloak. The other was a man of small stature, barely hitting the seven-foot mark. Eratilda, I've never seen Seme Kikan work so fluidly, Damien Chan, she said. I can't even sense anything off about you with my hockey. The young yet small man gave a knowing nod, it was Damien. He was using Seimei Kikan in tandem with his persona skill. Well, revealing my identity right now could bring a lot of trouble to your establishment, Shaki Ne. He wasn't far off. Damien's face has been broadcast all over the world. Added to his somewhat large height and a rather distinct appearance, it would be troublesome to be recognized now. Though he wasn't afraid of any marine response, it was more for Shaki's safety. The lush grassy roads of the archipelago were well maintained, perhaps for the luxury of the celestial dragons that liked to roam here. The usual design was found throughout the land, a wide street with food stalls and markets for the crowd. Dash. A while later. Grove 13. The two then made their way up the hill and onto a plateau. 
It was at least a hundred meters above the ground yet nothing compared to the sheer massiveness of the actual mangrove that stood even taller before their very eyes. Seemingly scraping the skies, here we are, Shaki said with a satisfied smile. Damien eyed the area, Grove 13 was near the center of the archipelago. It was connected to the other larger industries, the amusement park, the hotel area, the tourist zone and even the lawless region. The one place it was far from, the marine base located at Grove 66. Quite a nice place for a pirate establishment to flourish in. Plus, it was located on a high altitude, giving Shaki a decent time to react in the case of any mobs of pirates or marines that may attempt to take the reward on her head. Did you think of a name for the bar? Damien asked the excited woman. Shaki hummed while tapping her chin and gave a nod. Shaki's rip-off bar. Damien rolled his eyes, at least you're honest. He then walked slightly forwards. He raised both hands out, extended before himself. Grow freely, Kenny. Under Shaki's curious eyes, the hillside suddenly began to shake. Rumble. The giant mangrove far behind the area seemed to mold about as some of the roots began to dance like fluid material. At that moment, Kenny, the conscience of the Yurukiman mangrove's trees, was churning as per Damien's will. It took a few minutes but it seemed as if a large structure had appeared out of the ground, seemingly connected to the roots of the giant tree behind it. It was mixed with the sediments and other earth matter as it came into being. Brick walls with a rounded front area. Large doors and windows frames set. It was move-in ready. Eratilda, your powers will put all the construction workers out of commission. Walking in, there was a nice simplistic bar with a large counter and seating. You'll have to order the appliances and other furniture, I made what I thought would fit, Damien said. Shaki saw the main design and was instantly in love. Well I did put up what was in the original bar with some better quality, Damien thought as he tapped his finger on the thick wood. I love it, Damien Chan, thank you. The woman responded with a cheery smile. Well, as long as you don't rip me off when I come here then it's all good, Damien said with a nostalgic smile. Though he was only doing what he owed, Shaki had previously spent many hours helping Damien perfect his observation hockey. On top of that, she was one of the select few on the rocks ship that actually meant something after the past three and a half years since he became a pirate. The woman sat down on a stool while Damien sat on one of the seats. The two seemed lost in thought. You know Damien Chan, Shaki spoke up. Since Taicho. No, Zebek San's crew came to be, I had weeded out tens of cipher pole agents and thousands of undercover marines. The number of pirates who tried to attack at night with poison or sneak attacks wasn't low either. She blew out a large cloud of smoke and continued, my ravens were almost always there to take out these threats before they swelled up too much. But with that gone, the amount of infighting and chance of betrayal will balloon. Damien narrowed his eyes in thought and couldn't help but nod. Ahem, even with the captain's overwhelming spirit, the number of men trying to swipe the absurd bounties on our heads is only increasing. He then paused, but Shaki nay, you should know that I care less about a bunch of living corpses. The former pirate burst out into a hearty chuckle. Of course I know that. Some weak pirates who have to rely on sneak attacks can never take you down but the one you need to be careful of a cipher pole. Poof. Another cloud of smoke came into being as the woman continued to speak. Xerxes. I was able to get one of the CP3 agents to speak. Xerxes is the one who will surely have his rats sneak in. I wouldn't be surprised if they were already on board. Her eyes then drifted to the rays of sun that crept through the door left ajar. There is also another marine division I've heard about. Damien nodded. Like Cypher Polygus Zero is meant more to protect the interests of the Celestial Dragons. The Navy also has their own super undercover force. He then smiled, I already found a few of them. Rahaha, though it's more fun to keep them thinking their cover is still intact. Shaki shook her head with a defeated smile, well, just take care of yourself. The newly crafted wood boards creaked as some remaining air seemed to escape from below due to Damien's weight. He walked in front of the woman. I should be heading out now, Shaki nay, it will be hard to find Extinction Valley once the night hits. The woman nodded with a small smile as the two then walked out once more, the morning wind gracing them. Visit from time to time, you're always welcome here, Shaki said as she hugged the far taller young man. 
Damien was initially eight feet four and pathetically weak when he met the former pirate before him. Now, after three and a half years, he had almost hit eleven feet and with vastly superior strength from before. Rising from the West Blue to becoming one of the strongest pirates currently alive. I know you have a big goal in mind, Damien Chan, she said as they separated, barely reaching his upper chest. I've seen you grow from a young seedling to a strong and powerful tree that even the world government can't cut down. I guess I can only watch from the newspapers now, she said, chuckling at the last part. I'll be rooting for you from my little bar here, good luck, Damien. The red-eyed youth nodded slightly, noticing Shaki's lack of usual joking demeanor. The multiple world-level quests still sitting, waiting to be claimed were the first thing that came to mind. And yet, even after so much time and training, they still felt a ways away. I'll see you soon, Shaki Ne. The woman reputed as the Black Death could only stare at the horizon as she saw the air squeeze out a low whistle as the young man disappeared, off to untold horrors of the new world. I feel like he'll make me worry even more than usual, she hummed, walking back into the bar. Dash. A few hours later, through the sea of clouds was a flash of black and red. Damien was currently jetting through the skies, utilizing his flight of the six supreme arts. A very handy skill. In unison with his weather warping, it seemed as if a cut in the skies was ever present as the horrid weather of the new world was kept in control. Awakening is fully understanding the true capabilities of one's devil fruit's power, he thought. Paramecia with emission-type powers like growing mountains or producing strings gain the ability to turn the surroundings into their powers. Added to far greater control of said powers. A few notable awakened that came to be found were the likes of Zebek, Whitebeard, Shaki, Basara and the future Doflamingo and Douglas Bullet. Extinction Valley aka the Isle of Disasters. It should give me the push I need to fully awaken. I've partially done it with my Hadeen form, just a little more and it should be fully set he said while zipping through the air. Sybil, tell me about what comes after awakening. A voice erupted in his mind. Every fruit's final stage is that of complete comprehension, awakening, as you know it. But that doesn't mean you can't take it to a higher level either. Sybil went on to say, every fruit is restricted with a limit, the fruit rating. Damien nodded. The system fruit rating was a scale of 1 to 7 stars. Seven star fruits were dubbed as the ultimate class fruits, whereas the 6.5 star fruits were called the exceptional class fruits. Damien's pulverized pulverized fruit belonged to the latter. I remember Toki's fruit evolved when I gave her the eternal ore. Tell me exactly what fruit evolution can do, he asked with a certain expectation. Before getting to that, you need to know that all fruits follow a certain path. Each fruit has an inferior and or superior version of itself, she said. For example, the chill chill fruit is the weaker version of the cold cold fruit. And the cold cold fruit is the weaker version of the ice ice fruit. Flint flint fruit of the fire fire fruit and so forth and so on. Usually, these are made distinct by the fruit rating gap between them. If ice ice fruit is a 6.5 star fruit, then the cold cold fruit would be only a 6 star fruit. Damien understood the main idea, my fruit has such a thing too. The press press fruit leads to the divide divide fruit and finally to the pulverize pulverize fruit. From 5.5 to 5 to 6.5 stars, respectively. I take it they can go beyond into the 7 star category. Opening square bracket dot 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 closing square bracket. There was a bit of a pause until the voice continued. Normally that category is kept minimal. All fruit taken under the twelve world laws. They were the twelve forces that held the universe together. Life, death, eternity, infinity, mind, time, space, soul, power, reality, creation, and finally, destruction. Each category had a few devil fruits associated with them, some Damien had come into contact with. A devil fruit can evolve if it comes into contact with an item that can also be scaled at the same rating all the while having a certain connection to said fruit. Sybil said, like for Toki, as you said, the eternal ore grants eternity and endless time. Due to this connection and her time time fruit, she was able to evolve a step further. Can a 6.5 star fruit evolve into a 7 star fruit? Of course it can. Damien's eyes brightened as he heard the rather exciting news but you need to find a fitting fruit evolution token for that to even be something more than a dream. 
she concluded. Dash. Seven hours later, Damien had been continuously speeding through the clouds, leaving behind a trail of broken gases. The man was on a mission for sure. After hearing the possibility of fruit evolution, naturally, he was rather excited. That aside, his current goal in terms of increasing power remained to finally awaken. He ate his fruit at the tender age of seven. After a decade of growth with those powers, understanding them, reaching greater heights with them, he would finally awaken them. He was currently rated around the upper stages of high tier Yonko and the next big jump was only steps away. Dash. Another few minutes passed as Damien neared his destination. Zebek had gone to the Isle of Spirits, Death Valley, to fully understand his fruit and now Damien made his way to one of the other two valleys, Extinction Valley. Death Valley was a constantly mobile location that resided in an eternal hurricane. The howls of the fallen spirit were the legend that kept these winds ever raging. As for Extinction Valley, the accepted legend states that every natural disaster known to man could be found at this hell hole, and that all the terrors that have ravaged the world had originated from here. According to some conspiracy theorists, the Isle of Disasters is where quite a few fruits had come into being from. These included the Tremor Tremor fruit, the Tornado Tornado fruit, the Hurricane Hurricane fruit, the Volcano Volcano fruit, the Storm Storm fruit and many more. The theory seemed to hold some plausibility. All that aside, no rational soul would want to go here. Not even the Titan class Sea Kings dared to enter the boundaries of such a place. As for its location, it isn't fully documented. Naturally, there are those brave enough, or more accurately, foolish enough, to venture to this area. Alas, none returned to tell the tale. Only some broken legends pieced together. You wish to go to Extinction Valley. Head west beyond the New World. That's all that's known. After eleven hours of westward flying, Damien arrived at something out of the ordinary. Beyond him were the usual turbulent seas, except the real wonder was what was beyond it. He could see the giant tsunamis from far away. They weren't normal waves either. The waves are upside down. Damien was left stumped, for the land within his vision was being bathed by tides that seemed to be upside down. Powerful bangs erupted as endless amounts of waves smashed down upon the rocky lands. It was a giant land of coastal tsunamis. Added to the constant rain, it was quite the terror of a spectacle. Flutter. Damien then took out a parchment, it was a large brown paper that seemed to have been weathered by age. Left crinkly and greatly oxidized. Dash. Map of surroundings. Shows all land and sea area within 100 kilometers in all directions. By studying prior human interactions, the map can also generate certain qualities about distinct regions found within the map. This item has been refined. Dash. This item had been in Damien's inventory for a long time now. He got it all the way back alongside his beginner's gift pack. Chapter 3. The parchment seemed as if it could be blown away any second, alas, it began to flutter. Damien felt the subtle vibrations as the map seemed to be blessed with ink. Slowly but surely, distinct and rather exact imaging became apparent as a map was drawn, titled, Extinction Valley. Damien studied the map. There were eleven major regions. Where he was, in the east, the Tempest Channel, could be found. Further north would lead to the Desert of the Starved. Down to the southeast was the the Unknown Regions. To the southwest was the region named Hell. At the center was a ring-like region called the Ring of Untold Horrors. Within said the core of said ring was a small area titled the Haven. Near the northern center was a smaller land called Tremor District. Beyond that was the Savage Lands. If you went even further north, you would find, Stormy Beach. Traveling past all these would lead to the northernmost region, the, Tundra of Fleeting Hope. And lastly, one region unconnected to the rest. It was on the west side, a smaller island of its own. It was dubbed, No Man's Land. Damien currently needed to fully understand his fruit. Technically speaking, in another two to three years, he would awaken naturally. However, a greater war was about to erupt where even Yonko-level powers may fall. It was the grand event that was said to have caused the absolute annihilation of the Rock's pirates, a time not too far from now. Considering the danger of the coming terror, Damien had opted to awaken as soon as possible. He required a catalyst, one that stood before him now. 
A satisfied smile was worn on the young pirate's face. Well, let's begin. Dash. Hi. I just uploaded all the chapters of this fanfiction with this video. This fanfiction is on haters by the author for more than one year. There is no update on his returning. So you can assume this fanfiction has been dropped. Scam warning there is one guy who is claiming that this fanfiction belongs to him and he has uploaded 200 plus chapters on Patreon. So don't get scammed. If you have any questions you can ask me in comments. If you like this video please like, comment, share and most importantly subscribe also click on notification bell and set it on all.